turn to Revelation chapter 14. We're going to go through three chapters tonight. So I hope your brains are ready. We're going to get you ready for school. Um, but as soon as we get this up, you'll need to go to the end of the slides, all the way down to the end, and it'll say uh, the lamb, 144,000, and the seven bowls, I think is what it says. Uh, it's like the fifth from the last, I think. It'll be big, bold letters like that that says the lamb. There you go, right there. Awesome. Well, let's open in prayer tonight, and we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for this opportunity to come into your house once again and to uh, just open your word and, and to see what the message is that you have for us tonight. Pray that you open our hearts and our minds. Help us to be attentive to your voice. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, I am going to read some. We're going to skip through. My uh, challenge to you this week is because we're going to go so fast through these three chapters, um, I want you guys to read 14, 15, and 16 this week. Um, chapter 16, we'll probably look at most of it because I will be explaining a lot of it as we go through chapter 16. Um, chapter 14, it starts off with the lamb and the 144,000. And I'm going to start reading in verse 1 of chapter 14. And I'm very loud up here. I don't know. Um, starting in chapter 14 of verse 1, it says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of a loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang as if, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the sons who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These, are redeemed, these were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now the first thing that we have is the 144,000. Who are these 144,000? Jews, okay. With reading those first few verses, what would you guess by looking at what we just read, who, the, who are the 144,000? Okay, God's chosen people. But more specifically, look at that, those verses we just read. Because there's some debate here on, there are some scholars that um, fewer than really of what are, of who we really believe that the 144,000 are, but there's two different views of who this 144,000 people are. Read through those. What do you think? I want to be specific, not just God's chosen people, not the Jews. What do you think when you read that? There should be some clues in there that give you an indication that'll Okay, priests. That's a specific, 144,000 priests. Any of you guys? What do you think? Read through there. If I read this verse to you, who do you think this applies to? Uh, it says, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Do what? Guys, no, but they can be priests, they can be, they call them Jesuits, they, uh-huh, it's in parentheses, but that's not who we're talking about. <laughs> we're going to look at it here in just a second. That is part of the answer. <laughs> Would it be women? If you're looking at that verse and you're reading through there, here's the two views. Some believe that it's another 144,000 that have been chosen. They believe that it's 144,000 men. And here's why. Did you catch the verse that I just read? These are the ones who were not defiled with who? Women. Women. And they are virgins, for they are virgins. Now, 
what happens is, as we read this, you have to go back and actually look at what they're talking about and what is being um, presented here in this message. You got to remember there's a lot of symbolism in, uh, did I get that right, Paige? Yeah, she got me today, by the way. Uh-huh. But um, there's a lot of symbolism in Revelation. And a lot of it, if you don't study and you don't know what they're talking about, would lead you to believe that, hey, they're just talking about men. But what's actually happening here, this is the original 144,000 evangelists. And that's where you were corrected. It is the Jewish evangelists that were chosen from what? What were the 144,000 chosen from? Do what? From earth? Well, yeah, they are. But they were chosen from a specific area. What can you divide 144,000 by? There you go. 12 tribes of Israel. How many are from each tribe? 12,000. There are 12,000 evangelists that were chosen from each tribe. This is what is being meant in this passage. It's talking about the 144,000 that were chosen. But there are some that try to make you think or try to say that, hey, it's actually 144,000 different um, men chosen because of that verse there. And it's also believed there are some that say that it's 144,000 chosen from the church of today. Now, what's wrong with that? Exactly. There is no church. Why is there no church? Called up, raptured, yeah. The church has been raptured. So it couldn't be the 144,000 from the church age. It couldn't be a new group that were chosen. So it's the 144,000 Jewish evangelists that were chosen and set aside. There's also something else in here that lets us know that it's the 144,000 Jewish evangelists. What type mark do they have? Yeah, only on their forehead, not on their right hand. They didn't receive the mark of the beast. As we, if we read further on in the passage, it actually talks about that, that they didn't receive the mark of the beast and that's what it's talking about in that verse where it says, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. It's actually talking about religion. In this time, we are ending the time of tribulation. Matter of fact, when we get to the end of the lesson tonight, God's wrath is fully poured out upon the earth. And the earth will be forever changed when we're done with tonight, when we see at the end of the, the bowls tonight. But, and I lost my train of thought, sorry. Um, it talks about the mark of the beast, how they've not received the mark. They have a mark that nobody else has. It talks about a song that only they can sing. And the reason for that is because they come out of the tribulation unscathed. They did not bow down to the beasts that we talked about last week. You know, the, the unholy trinity that we talked about last week. You have Satan. You have the Antichrist, which was the beast of the what? There you go, beast of the sea. And the false prophet was the beast of the what? Yeah, beast of the land or beast of the earth. And so that he set up his unholy trinity and was setting up a one world religion. He implemented the mark of the beast, which could be one of three things. And a lot of times we only talk about the mark of the beast as 666. But it actually can be his name. It could be uh, the mark of the beast. And then, anybody remember the third well, that's the number, the number of his name. It could be his name. The number of his name. Yeah, that's the number of his name is 666. That's the number of his name, right? The number of his name and the name and the mark of the beast. Is that what it is? Okay, yeah, it's right there in the verse. Okay. I got something on my nose there, excuse me. <laughs> But that's, that's where the three are. But here's something. Other than being Jewish, what else sets the 144,000 apart from everyone else? We've talked about that. And that is that they had a mark on their head. That they were set apart by God. They were the only ones that have this mark that um, God had given them. Um, they had a, of course, they had the special mark. And that is the, that no one else had that mark. Now, there are other marks going around, and there will be false marks that will be given. People trying to get food when they weren't allowed to have the food or because they wouldn't take the mark of the beast. 
Um, and so, but this is a mark unique because God put it on them. Um, how is it possible for the 144,000 to remain alive and unharmed during the time of the great tribulation? How do y'all think? Yeah. They're chosen. God chose them. God put a protective hedge around them. This is how they're going to come through the great tribulation, through all of the destruction that we saw in the first three and a half years, and all that's going to take place at the end. It's because of God's protection that they have. Um, when you are God's person doing God's will, you are immortal until God is finished with you. That's a statement for you to write down. When you are God's person doing God's will, you are immortal until God is finished with you. If God gives Bradley a specific task and God says, Bradley, you're going to live until you're 25 years old and this is what you're going to do. When is Bradley going to die? Why won't he die at 23? That's right. When you're God's person doing God's will, you are immortal until God is finished with you. Okay? When you're doing what God has you to do, everything happens in his timing. And that's how this 144,000 is going to be able to come through the great tribulation unscathed. It doesn't mean that they won't suffer. It doesn't mean that they won't have persecution. But they're going to come through without losing their lives. And that's because God protects them. We go on and read. Um, there are three angels that are going to make some proclamations. Um, it says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, for, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of the water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Now if we notice and we go on through the next verses, I'm not going to read the rest of 14, but it's talking about the great harvest. Um, God is making a proclamation that the great harvest is ready. He's talking about that it's time to bring his people, his chosen out, because he's about to pour his full wrath upon the earth as we look at the seven bulls. Now something unique about chapters 14 and 15 setting up to chapter 16 is this is a rest period. If you noticed between the different judgments when we had uh, the trumpet judgments, you had the seal judgments, then you had the trumpet judgments, there was a time of rest. And there's a reason for this. As we've gone through the last three or four weeks, it's been nothing but doom and gloom. I mean, we've seen the destruction. We see that what's going to happen when the Antichrist takes control, the devastation, the heartache that's going to be on the face of the earth. And here's something that I want y'all to just really let sink in. Look at the person to your right. Everybody turn to your right. Look at the person to your right. All right, now everybody turn and look at the person to your left. Do you know that it's very possible that those people that you just looked at could reject Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and they could have to go through all of this that we've talked about? Somebody you go to school with. This is how real it is. This isn't just a Bible story. We are living in the end times right now. 
There is nothing left that has to happen for God to call the church home and the tribulation begin. Your very friends that you hang out with day in and day out could be some of them that are going to face the torments that we've already looked at and those that we're going to see later tonight. And the ones that come later tonight, you don't want to be here. But it could be some in this room. It could happen. Were you raising your hand for a question or just? Okay, no, you weren't. <laughs> I thought you had a question. I was, um, but that's how important it is. You know, we read the scripture and we look at it and we see the Old Testament. And we say, hey, that happened, you know, 5,000 years ago or that happened 4,000 years ago or, or even that might have happened, you know, 1,000 years ago. We are living right now at the precipice of the tribulation. It could start at any day. All it takes is for God to call the church home. For God to be ready and say, hey, it's time. And then it begins. And if you're not one of them that's raptured out of here, you're one that's stuck here through this. And to my knowledge, none of you are of Jewish descent. So none of you will be the 144,000 that are specially set aside and marked. And so you're going to have to go through the torments and stuff if you choose to reject Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I mean, that's how serious it is. It's not just a story of say, hey, this could happen later on. It's going to happen. And when you see later tonight what's going to happen, it's not fun. There's nothing pleasant. I don't have any words to describe the torment that's going to happen when God pours out his full wrath. At this point, God has just poured out limited. He hadn't unleashed his full wrath. He is also, something we're going to look at here in just a minute, is that up until this point, there's been a chance for repentance. There's been a chance for them to repent and to accept Jesus Christ. But we're coming to a point when we get to chapter 16 that that's no longer an option. They've rejected God for the very last time. They'll no longer have the option to repent of their sins and to follow Jesus. They won't have that option. When, that, when God pours out his full wrath, when he starts, the bowls start being poured out, there's no more repentance. And we'll see in Scripture. I'll show you where he tells us that in Scripture. Um, the bowl judgments versus the trumpet judgments. There's a lot of similarities. When we look at these, you're going to see some similarities between the trumpet judgments and the bowl judgments. Uh, there are uh, many similarities between the three, uh, I'm sorry, between the trumpets and bowl judgments. However, there are three main differences. The first one is the bowl judgments are complete, whereas the trumpet judgments were partial. If you go back and you look, when God destroyed or God, uh, when he destroyed the trees or when he destroyed the waters or when he destroyed the sea, it was partial. It was a third. It was a fourth. The one thing that was all was all the green grass. But it was partial in the trumpet judgments. When we look at the bowl judgments here in just a second, they are complete. It is full. It is everything. It's not partial. God's judgment is going to be complete. And so that's one of the, the first uh, difference between the two. The second is the trumpet judgments still allowed unbelievers the opportunity to repent. Whereas the bowl judgments do not. Once the bold judgments start, the option for repentance has been removed. And that's what we're reading here in uh, chapter 14 where it's talking about blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. It's talking about, and then when we get down and if you read the rest of chapter 14, it's talking about the harvest. God is saying, hey, go, the harvest is ready. Take your sickle, go down, the harvest is ready. Get my children out of here because he's about to implement his wrath. What other story did that happen in Scripture? I got a candy bar for you for this one. Where else in Scripture did that happen? No. 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 He did destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. There you go. Noah's Ark. He only saved his chosen people. Everybody else had rejected him. Destroyed the whole earth. Let's see, what kind of candy bar? You like Butterfingers? 
Can you catch it? If you don't, I'm going to call you Butterfinger. Oh, <laughs> she caught it with her nose. <laughs> but the flood, total annihilation. God destroyed the entire earth with a flood, a global flood. He saved how many people? Eight. There you go. Saved eight people. Look, I got a small candy bar for you for that one. Yeah, he saved eight. Noah and his family. Okay? So this is going to happen again. We're going to see, but there's not going to be an opportunity for repentance. Once those doors were shut on the ark, the people couldn't come in once the rain began to fall. Once God opened the heavens and opened the earth and the water began to fall, we don't see anywhere in Scripture where those people were allowed to repent. Their fate was sealed. And we're going to see that again tonight in these Seven bowls of God's wrath. The third is mankind is indirectly affected by several of the trumpet judgments. But mankind is directly attacked by all the bowl judgments. As we look at the trumpet judgments, they're only partial, only um, certain areas of people. We're not given the exact area of people, but we're given a percentage of people that were affected. And it was hit or miss. You didn't know it was, you know, it, it could have been... Um, Maddie and Alexa's not touched by the bowls or something. But when the bowls start being poured out and this wrath comes out, it is everybody that's on the face of the earth. And that's how we know that God has removed his people. Also because the verses uh, 14 through, uh, 20, through verse 20 of chapter 14 is talking about the harvest. Now, seven bold judgments. We're going to look in chapter 16. 15, I'm going to go ahead and read chapter 15. This is setting up. We're now getting in, and they're fixing to make the proclamation. The angels are going to let us know that, hey, the bold judgments are about to begin. And here in chapter 15, starting in verse 1, it says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, and having their chests girded with golden bands. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels gave I'm sorry gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Now back in the first part of chapter 15 we see another phrase again that lets us know that God has removed his people off of the face of the earth. And it talks about where, as you're looking, um, in starting in verse 2, and it says, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. And talking about these are the ones that have come out of the tribulation that repented of their sins, trusted in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and they have been saved. Now we're getting to the point to where that time is being shut off. God is about to shut that door of the ark like he did in Noah's ark. When he shut the door, it wasn't Noah that shut the door. Because what would happen, let's imagine, if uh, Brother Kerry was... Noah and he was in charge of the ark and brother Kerry had the ability to shut and open the ark door what do you think is going to happen as soon as the water starts falling and people start banging on the door do you think brother Kerry is going to have the ability to sit in there and not open that door no I wouldn't and that's why God 
shut and sealed the ark. Because Noah and them were going to hear the, tur the turmoil and hear the destruction that were going to take place. It's the same way here. Everybody that's on the face of the earth is about to be affected by this. God has removed all of his children and now his wrath is going to be poured out. And we come to our seven bowls of judgment. Um, the bowl judgments are God's final and complete judgments on the earth. They end, or the end has come. Now, that statement says that it's his final judgment here on earth. Where's the next judgment going to take place? There you go. Great white throne judgment. Yeah. We're actually going to read about Armageddon. Some of you mentioned that. We're going to read about that later on. But God's final judgment here on earth, we're going to see here in these next seven bowls. The next judgment takes place at the great white throne judgment. The first bowl, Lotham Soars. Starting in verse 1 of 16, it says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. In verse 2, it says, So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Now remember again, when we see that word men, it's not talking about just the male species. It's talking about humankind, mankind. Everybody was hit with, or everyone that had received the mark of the beast is going to be plagued with these sores. Here it's talking about one major sore. Could you imagine your whole body being a blister? I mean, you know how bad a blister hurts when it's on your hand or maybe on your foot. Now imagine your whole body being a blister. This is the first bowl of seven. Everybody that's on the face of the earth is going to have this. Nobody is exempt. And it continues on in verse 3 and we get to the second bowl. And these are happening pretty quick. We're not told exact time frame, but I imagine as God, once he releases the angels, these are going to happen one right after another. Uh, verse 3, it says, Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man. And every living creature in the sea died. How much of the sea was affected by this second bowl? All of it. Now imagine, you've seen a global map. What is it, 70% of the earth is covered in water? I think that's about right. 70% of the earth is going to be turned to blood. It says the blood of a man. So it's going to be turned to blood. It's not like just a thin layer. The entire oceans that we know. And every living creature is going to die. Can you imagine the stench that's going to take place after that? You'll no longer be able to eat fish or things of the sea. They're all dead. And you imagine the hundreds of thousands, millions of animals that are going to die. No, it's in the water that lives in the water. Every living thing that lives in the water is going to be killed. Is it just the sea or is it lakes? Well, we're going to get to that in just a minute. In this bowl, it's just the sea. The entire sea, every ocean that we know... Pacific Ocean, Atlantic Ocean, uh, the Indian Ocean. Um, help me out. All these. There you go. See? All these other oceans that are out there. 70% of the earth is covered by water and is going to be turned to blood. Just the stench. Um, and I don't want to go too far and too gross, but I want to paint a picture for you. How many of you hunt in here? How many of you ever field dressed a deer before? And you know what that smell of that blood is. Now imagine 70% of the earth smelling like that. Just the blood alone. Not to mention the dead animals that are going to be. It's going to be atrocious. And that's the second bowl. All living creatures in the sea are killed by this judgment. The third one. The third bowl. Bowl. In verse 4 it says, Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, 
the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from, and I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. So now you see we've had all sea, all the oceans, and now in the third one, what happens? All fresh water is turned to blood. There is now no water left on the earth that has not been touched or been turned to blood. Everything that's going to live in those waters will be dead as well. And so now every form of water, when it says springs, it's talking about if you go out here to our creek, this creek runs wet all year long. There's a spring somewhere. I don't know where that spring is, but that water has fresh water coming into it. That's the springs of water. It's talking about the springs that are coming out of the ground. Even those springs are going to be turned to blood. It won't be fresh water coming out of the ground anymore. It's going to be blood coming out of the ground. And again, you imagine the stench of just the blood alone. And then when you see some of these next ones that are about to happen, when you heat that blood up, the smell that begins to come, and as you heat the rotting flesh, this is what's going to be transpiring on the earth. The fourth bowl. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. Now imagine right now on our earth, we have, what is it that protects us from the sun? The ozone. If we remove that ozone layer, if we remove our atmosphere, and we're exposed to the full extent of the sun, do you know how quick you'll be burnt? instantaneously now you notice that it doesn't kill them because what happens when God allows this angel to strike the sun and allows the full force of the sun to come through and to scorch mankind what happens look in those verses somebody tell me what happens yeah they blaspheme God they cursed God they know there's a creator the Bible's telling us they're, they're cursing the one that's causing all this to happen and yet they still won't repent. God has removed his people. These are the ones that chose to reject God. You know, a lot of times, and, and I'm even guilty myself, when I was a teenager and even in my early 20s before the Lord saved me and I gave my life to God, I made statements like this. Oh, I'd rather go to hell and have a party with all my friends. So how much of what I've read tonight sounds like a party? And that's not even hell. That's just the wrath of God being poured out on mankind. He hadn't even cast you into the lake of fire for all eternity. Where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Where the worm never dies. But yet people still curse him. They still blaspheme God for all this. They reject him to the very end. That's a dangerous game to play to say, hey, I'm just going to wait. I'll wait until this happens and the rapture happens. It's a dangerous game. Uh, and I just lost all power. There we go. All right, it's back. Sorry. <laughs> Everything went black. I was like, wait a minute, I don't have anything. The fourth bowl, mankind is scorched. All of mankind is going to be scorched by the sun. How many of you have ever been sunburnt real bad? Yeah. How many of you have ever been burnt beyond a sunburn? Like you've been burnt by a fire? We know Kobe. We saw some of his blisters. His whole back was a blister. He got so sunburned here not too long ago. Uh, when I was in the military, uh, before I joined the military, I was a lifeguard in Dixon. And uh, I lifeguard for two summers. And uh, I got, you know, used to the sun. And I got to where I really didn't have to wear sunscreen here in Tennessee. And so when I went into the military, I went in in um, August. Actually, it was the end of August and went to basic training. By the time I got to Florida, it was around January time frame, I guess. Well, I thought, hey, you know what? I don't need any sunscreen. I've been, 
you know, I've been a lifeguard for two years. I don't need sunscreen. I'm, I'm okay. Well, I get down there. How many of you have ever been down to Fort Walton Beach or Pensacola area or Destin, Panama City? Y'all been down there? What color are their beaches? White. What happens when light hits white? Yeah. It reflects back up. I had no sunscreen on. I got so sunburnt, I could not put my uniform on. I couldn't, right here was just purple. I was burnt so bad. I couldn't put my uniform on. I had to go in and stand before my sergeant because I was so burnt, but I couldn't even put my uniform on. And so I had to go in in civilian clothes, loose-fitting clothes that barely touched my skin. And uh, I got in a lot of trouble because I didn't take the precaution. But now imagine when God pours out this bowl, when you step foot out that door right there, and those rays of the sun hit you and you're scorched. And yet they still curse God. They blaspheme God. They reject God. They curse God because of what he's doing. In the fifth bowl. Uh, in verse 10. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and on his kingdom. And his kingdom became full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. The, they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. And did not repent of their deeds. And so now what happens? God now strikes the earth with darkness. It talks about his kingdom and sometimes we might think, well, that's just talking about Babylon or that's just talking about over in the Middle East that it'll be struck with darkness. But as we study scripture, who is the ruler of this world right now? Come on. Satan. Satan. He has been given limited power of this world. And when I say this world, I'm talking about all the things that are against God. The entire world is going to be struck with darkness. And it talks about how when this darkness comes, they do what again? They praise God, don't they? What do they do? They curse him even more. Because of the darkness and because of the pain that they're having to go through because of these sores. And they refuse to repent. That's the fifth bowl. Here's the sixth bowl. Starting in verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragons, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. And what's that battle called? Armageddon. Armageddon. Verse 15, and we'll look at that later on in one of the later chapters. Uh, verse 15, it says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. And here we see that the river Euphrates, and if you look on a map and you see where the river Euphrates runs, it actually divides like the top part of Iran, Russia, China, all that from coming into Israel. There's a big river there, and it's called the Euphrates River. It's there right now. And the, the interesting thing about this river drying up is it's going to allow the east to come in freely without being restricted by this river. We're not talking about like a little river, like if you go down here and see the Tennessee River, that's a big river. But if you look at the Euphrates River, it's even bigger than that. And this is going to dry up and make it possible. And we see that what happens here is that the unholy trinity, what happens? What do they do? Yep, but what do they do? Look in those verses. What does it say comes out of their mouth? The symbolism there is talking about frogs. Where else are we told about frogs? Yeah, the plagues in Egypt. But then it goes on as you read further in the next verse that tells you what those frogs are. What are they? Demons. They might look like dragons. They very well could be. But they send out demons. What are these demons doing? No. Do what? 
Yeah. Satan is still trying to deceive. And he's doing a job because none of them are willing to repent. He's also sending these demons out not only to do the miraculous signs, but he's sending them out to recruit the kings of the earth. Those that have bowed down to the Antichrist. Those that have rendered their allegiance to him. And he's calling them together for a final battle. And he's bringing them all in so they can all attack the land of Israel. Uh, the seventh bowl. Uh, first it says, due to this, look at uh, the sixth one there, this note here. It says, due to this river uh, drying up, it'll allow for the rulers that belong to Satan to advance on Israel and make war with her. Okay? They're coming in and they're going to attack with a vengeance. Um, verse 17, the seventh bowl. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. Who is this speaking? God. He sits on the throne. He is now saying, it is done. And when you see what happens in this plague, you'll understand why. He says, it is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plagues of the hell, since the plagues was exceedingly great. Now I want you to imagine, how many of you feed animals at your house? How many of you carry a full 50-pound bag of feed? Not every time. Not every time, yeah, but you, you lift it or you might put it into the feed bin or you empty the bags of feed. These hailstones are going to average 75 pounds. And if you actually look up the weight of a talent, there are two different weights. There's the weight of the common talent, which is 75 pounds. And then there's the weight of the royal talent, which is 150 pounds. So imagine balls of ice coming out of the sky that weigh anywhere from 75 to 150 pounds. How much do you weigh, Caleb? 85. Could you imagine? 150 pound hailstone coming towards Caleb? Yeah. That'd be like a bug on a windshield. But not only that, as these hailstones are being poured out on the face of the earth, still, what's mankind doing? Yeah. Cursing and refusing to repent. And as we see this happening, then there's a great earthquake. How great is this earthquake? Yeah. Uh, who's got their phone and has internet? Look up the height of uh, Mount Everest. Isn't that the tallest mountain on the earth? One of them. Look up what is the height of Mount Everest? <laughs> 29,000. 29 feet. Okay. I'm five foot ten. Imagine 29,000 feet high. If you're standing at the base of the mountain, this earthquake hits, the Bible tells us that the mountains are seen no more. That is a mighty earthquake. To take a mountain that is 29,000 feet tall and bring it to the ground as if it was just flat. And it talks about the islands of how they're dispersed. It's going to be a mighty earthquake. And this is God is crying out and he's saying, it is done. Now, we're going to look, and some of the things that we're looking fall into this time frame of these things that are happening in the Battle of Armageddon. These things are all going to be taking place. But when God pours out his final wrath, it's over. We read in 2 Peter, I believe it is, that talks about how the earth is going to be destroyed by fire. 
You imagine all the lava, all the stuff that's inside the earth right now. Um, how many of you followed the, the um, volcano in Hawaii that was just spewing? It really wasn't erupting real big, but it was just active lava just flowing, flowing, flowing. And all the destruction it did. Imagine an earthquake that will flatten Mount Everest. And the lava that in, and the, just the fire that it's going to unleash. This is what's ahead for those that reject Jesus Christ. But you know what? I got good news for you. You can escape that. And all you have to do is repent of your sins and trust in Jesus Christ and him alone. And allow him to wash you white as snow. And he will make you his child. You don't have to buy anything special. You don't have to give a certain amount of money to the church. God says if you will repent and call on the name of Jesus, you will be saved. And that's all it takes. And then you become a child of God. God does a transformation in your life. He becomes the Lord of your life. And he begins to mold you and make you into who he wants you to be. And that's my hope for each one of you here tonight is that you've made that decision. If you haven't, you need to get it right. Because, again, there is nothing left that has to happen other than the sound of the trumpet and Jesus in the sky calling us home. That's it. So tonight, where do you stand with God? Have you repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus Christ? I hope that you have. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for tonight. Lord, I thank you for your word. Even as we see this destruction that's going to be poured out, God, you have given us a time now to where we have the opportunity to repent of our sins and to trust in you as our Lord and Savior. And Father, that you'll give us the strength and the courage that we need to live the life that you've called us to live. And God, I pray for each of these teens as they're going to start school this next week. God, I pray that you would give them a hunger and a desire for your word. I pray that you'd give them a boldness, that they would be willing to share your good news with their friends at school. And Father, I just pray that you'd give them the strength. I pray that you would use them in a mighty way. Lord, we love you and we praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen.